please join me in welcoming Brenda Marie Osby. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Hermine. And thank you to the committee for the 50th. And thank you to the College of William and Mary. I'm going to read a couple of things. Uh, the poem that I was commissioned to read is what I'm going to begin with. And it is as yet untitled. Um, it has one of those longish, title-ish things. On the semicentenary of the integration of the College of William and Mary, 1967. There are three, three epigraphs at the beginning. Um, quote, laws permitting and even requiring separation do not necessarily imply the inferiority of either race to the other. Plessy versus Ferguson, 163, United States, 537, 1896. Quote, the legal education offered petitioner is not substantially equal, and the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment requires that he be admitted. Sweat versus Painter, 339, United States, 629, 1950. Quote, we must look instead to the effect of segregation itself on public education. Brown versus the Board, 347, United States, 483, 1954. On the semicentenary of the integration of the College of William and Mary. One. Supreme Court rulings are gathered and recorded alphabetically by name of petitioner, name of respondent following. Edged in thin gold, their red and black labels are indistinguishable one from another, except for the numbers embossed there, volume and case in gold too. Pointing for our instruction and improvement to plainly worded statements become law of the land, entitled quite simply, United States Reports. Report by definition being a formal account taken down in writing and intended for publication. These then are the formal accountings of the slow crawl to something bearing on parity, printed and bound together in volumes of drab khaki, accountings thereafter immune to alteration. To make law is to direct the course of history, or so we've been taught, or told, or would like to believe. But landmark cases have been won always on the lives of people. Not only individuals and parties and classes bringing suit, also and especially families' lives, built over time of intimacy and need, and the dream of something called better, something called right. Consider, for instance, that special kind of terror reserved for Negro girl children with their book straps and lunch boxes, smartly gathered or pleated dresses, and socks folded over just so, their braids and barrettes, who walked past white mothers cursing, screaming, spitting nigger, nigger, like anybody's business who walked past white policemen standing silent, weapons gleaming, walked straight ahead across sidewalks and barricades and playgrounds, up and down stairs, to classrooms and to lunchrooms, to libraries and to toilets, someone always on the ready spitting nigger or else standing silently by like nobody's business. Are those teenaged and preteen Negro boys who did not, could not tell any apparently responsible nearby adult the brutalities that befell them during team sports or in hallways, after lights out, behind unlocked dormitory doors and honor codes of recently formerly white preparatory schools, where some well-meaning teacher required that they hand in, in a timely manner, please, tomorrow's assignment on current events. 
children called upon by family and the heft of generations, by neighborhoods and coordinating committees, by nighttime church people preaching deseg served up between Bible verses and fresh lemon meringue pie freshly, cleanly sliced through, by organizers and activists, some of them barely past childhood themselves, and the marching and the singing and the inky, slick smell of mimeographed leaflets passed around night and day. Some granddads, some aunties, some mother's child, some father's child at seven or 10 or 14 years old had to wake up and stand up and walk straight in, had to step across that threshold into the glare, not only of cameras and news reporters, lawyers and judges and shiny, brassy, starred policemen, had to get up early in the morning, sit very straight and eat a hearty breakfast with lots of cold milk or hot cocoa to begin another day of representing the race and being very proud, very good, not letting anybody turn them back or around and getting good grades. Trusting parents, all older Negroes, some one or two white policemen to keep them safe every day and also alive. And walk into history's pages and its changing tide. The weight, the weight, all for something grand and furious sounding like freedom or justice. Two, old institutions of young countries are vested in anniversaries, birthing and naming days, coin strikings with their noted percentages of silver and of gold people, places, conceptions, and concepts, emblems of origins of origins. Not far from here, the mingling of bloods and bloodlines, populations said to be at peace, already engaged in early trade, in food and truck and labor, bloody flux and scurvy and slough looting and thievery between English and Portuguese pirates of goods intended for sale in old New Spain, out of Angola, 20 and odd. Not far from here, pounds sterling and acres to Christianize Indian children and train them up in true religion, moral virtue, and civility. A King's Land Grant College that neither he nor anyone ever would see interrupted as it happens by war, only the second Anglo-Powhatan. Nascent colony scourged, the Powhatan whose acreage it was, having had other ideas for its uses, other ideas for their children. A people soon decimated, subdued in bloodshed and blood white, stabilizing economies of labor and truck, attending peace and moral virtue, civility, etc etc. Not a full century later, and not so far from there, the old drive to build and to educate culminates at last in a college, offering physics and metaphysics, mathematics, logic, ethics, all the courses of natural and of moral philosophy, and a small school for the Christian education of enslaved and free Negro children besides. All of it, all of it, supported by the labor of the enslaved in tobacco, of the enslaved hired out to small farms, laboring in the college itself, its halls and lecture rooms and dormitories, cooking and serving meals in its kitchens and refectory, treating students in its infirmary, chopping wood and keeping lit and stoked the fires in the fireplaces in every room of the place, maintaining the buildings and grounds, performing every manner of personal service to every white on the place, their labor providing the income, providing the scholarships of the wealthy young men whom they served. The 1760 list of Negroes at college can almost be read as a record of attendance and enrollment not intended for publication. Daniel, two Geralds, Charlotte and Lemon, Lucy and Molly hired out. Letty and Betty and James. The number of invalids and near invalids, like Dick, is impressive. 
Only Lemon is referred to as having died and been buried from a college purse. Where were their sick beds? Where are their graves? And then, between the death and burial of Lemon and the enrollment of Hewlin Willis are some 140 years. Between the enrollment of the first white women and that of the first black women, just shy of 50 more. More than twice that number since young Jefferson opined that here at this college, he would acquire more universal acquaintance and likewise learn something of the mathematics. Just so, just so, natural and moral philosophy and logic and rhetoric and labor and truck. And even after admission, the letters, the letters, quote, as you know, the college is a state institution and must conform to state law. Under present regulations, we are unable to accept. Quote, your recent letter has been referred. Quote, Virginia State College carries courses. Quote, we shall not be able under present state regulations to register your Negro school supervisor. If it is agreeable to you and to the members of the workshop, there will be no objection to her attending as visitor. There would, of course, be no charge. Inter-office memo. If this letter to Floyd Stokes Jr., Negro, is satisfactory, I shall mail it out today. The letter in full. Dear Mr. Stokes, Enclosed herewith is your $5 money order for the 1955 summer session application fee. With all best wishes, I am sincerely yours. Dear Mrs. Amos, dear Mrs. Carter, dear Miss Hicks, dear Mrs. Carter, Mrs. Carter, memorandum for file, that I would write her that her letter did not give us sufficient time her total qualifications and the law of the state. So many are these applications that the college president himself turns at last to the eternal attorney general for relief. We have in the past refrained from referring to you such matters. In this case, however, after Sweat versus Painter, after Brown versus the board, after how many letters of refusal and internal memos and appeals to attorneys general, after stacks of returned $5 fees sufficient alone to fill their own khaki tomes, until autumn 1967 and three Negro co-eds admitted without incident, assigned dormitory housing, rooming together in Jefferson Hall. By what logic and reasoning, other than the pressure, the gravity of time and the times, compounded by how many more letters, neatly folded, dutifully bearing the required fees, transcripts and photographs so neatly attached? Louisiana, Texas, Kansas, Carolina, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, Alabama, Georgia, an unfolding, continually expanding map of faces, the dark face of the dark country, until exactly three enter together, take up residence, and matriculate, go on. And then one interview, winding to its close, then firmly, plainly, as if having never before been said, we didn't do anything. We came to school. Eli, Brown, Strafer, and Briley. Nearly everyone here knows those names by now. And many, no doubt, have a sense, no doubt, of knowing these women as well. Be careful in that and more careful still how much and how often you call out those names. For what is clearest of all in each of those articles and features and interviews is what? A something, if not unsaid, 
then surely spoken only ever among themselves, if then. A familiar coat of worn yet substantial cloth, without visible hem stitch or seam, presentable, clean, equally suited for travel at home and abroad, passed carefully about among only these three. Be careful of what you think you know or want to know. There are three. There are eras and epochs, centuries and decades, generations and turning moments, and then there are years. Years. 1967. 1967 was a banner year for civil disobedience for marches and sit-ins, and a long, hot summer of more than 150 riots in U.S. city streets. It was a year of non-violent student coordinating and revolutionary organizing, and a very good year for Ali's stand against an unjust war, any war, and countless ordinary young black men against the draft. It was a year of promise for actions for workers and for poor people's campaigns for Thurgood Marshall's appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court, for Aretha's R-E-S-P-E-C-T, for the Fisk Writers Conference ushering in a new black poetry, for Baraka, black arts, black theater, and plain black love, for Nina's wishing just to know how it feels to be free, for Afros and black beauty, black is beautiful and black panthers, for freedom schools and black studies, and everything else besides and between and before. It was a good year to be three young black women entering the university of their choosing without apparent incident. It was a good year to look into the eyes of one's Negro parents and grands and every other Negro fearing every other heartbeat for your safety, for your life, and say yes and say no. Take up one's blackness and test it and taste it and find it not at all wanting. To pick it up like a pair of shoes or familiar coat and step up and stand up and walk straight out and onto those streets. It was a very good year to be young alive and blacker even than you knew.